Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time speaking in Alabama, and I feel a little bit uh, out of the water in the sense that um, my family history is in Ontario, Canada, and I have three or four brothers at uh, farm, three or four, meaning, yes, I have four brothers, <laughs> one of whom farms part-time, so I don't sometimes know whether to count that as a farmer. But it's also an interesting thing in the sense that um, I've always been a student of corn going back to my university days. Um, and I also um, am very passionate about farmers because farmers are the ones that really put the system together. And they put the system together for you know, the current genetics at the time on their soils with uh, the best possible management advice. And, um, and sometimes that passion for production is, is sort of what drives, um, you know, being satisfied with the yields that you got for a given season, for a given hybrid, et cetera. And so I also um, have, the, have the opportunity to do not only work at Purdue, where I've been for the last 16 years, but I also have an opportunity to watch over the shoulder of uh, my son, who is farming in Texas. Um, in irrigated agriculture. So I don't pr profess to be an, an expert here. I'm still uh, fairly young in the sense that although I've worked on corn for 30 years, I've got a lot to learn. And so I'd be appreciative of your questions as we go forward here. In the research that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to say that my context essentially is one of trying to um, do the best possible job on the production side, but not forgetting the environmental side. And so for uh, most of my career now, I've kind of promoted the concept of no-till and strip-till uh, corn production systems in order to save soil. And so we're, regardless of whether we're looking at nutrients or hybrids, it's important to be part of a sustainable system. Uh, first of all, because the Lord requires us to be stewards, but secondly, because of the fact that uh, we want to essentially enhance the, um, the soil health. It's a very popular term, of course, at the moment. And so what I'd like to do is to start off with a bit of context. Um, Indiana, um, we have uh, certainly both forested soils as well, well as prairie soils. And when I came to Purdue 16 years ago, I was able to inherit uh, one of the long-term tillage plots that had been in existence since 1975. And that uh, study is one in which uh, we've been able to compare no-till and very um, uh, strip-till and, and other uh, systems. So this is a dark prairie soil, and, um, and these are our, our plots, 150 foot long, 30 feet wide. The average um, strip-till uh, corn is uh, here in the grain, and it's averaging about 210 bushels per acre in a corn-soybean program, and it's averaging about 190 bushels per acre in continuous corn. But the main reason for showing this slide is essentially to say that uh, there's nothing better, really, than growing corn in rotation. The continuous corn yields continue to suffer at the rate of uh, at least 10 and sometimes as much as 20 bushels or more. And that was also true this year when we had 270 bushel corn uh, because we had a much higher uh, productivity season. But one of the things that any system does on farms is that it affects sort of um, the soil properties, not just the structure or the relative amount of wind and water erosion, but it also affects nutrient stratification. And so as we think about trying to push higher yield levels, we need to think about nutrient stratification and whether or not the new roots for any particular stage of corn growth are actually in a zone where uh, nutrient supply is adequate. And so for instance, in this experiment, we've been uh, doing uh, moldboard plow, chisel plow, strip tail, and no-till for many, many years. And you can kind of see that in a continuous no-till program for corn soybean, um, there's about a uh, three to one ratio for uh, soil phosphorus in the top four inches compared to uh, the lower four inches. But you also see a similar degree of stratification, not quite as severe in a chisel plow system. And indeed, anything other than a moldboard plow will lead to stratification. Now, in a sandier soil situation, you wouldn't have quite this extent of stratification. 
Um, and it's also true that everything depends on how much rainfall do you actually receive or how much irrigation water do you apply. Uh, this is true for a silty clay soil, which holds on to P and K fairly tightly. Um, for a situation where we have 40 inches of uh, natural rainfall per year and where there is uh, no irrigation. The influence on soil test K is almost exactly the same in terms of tillage systems, fairly uniform, um, averaging about 140 parts per million. This is parts per million down here, so this would be the same thing as uh, 280 pounds per acre. Uh, fall to the plow str stratified and no-till stratified even more. Um, and so that's just something to think about as we uh, think about nutrient application programs because if your only program is one of broadcast application, then for a given soil and a given rainfall and a given cropping program where you've got removal from these dif different depths and where you've got the depositing again of the, of the uh, stover, let's say, that's left over on the surface, you've always got a recycling going on and uh, the amount of stratification that you have is not just dependent on yield levels, but it's very much dependent on where you're actually placing the nutrients themselves. And so for, um, for several years, we've been looking at uh, nutrient placement uh, options other than broadcast. And, um, and sometimes those are part and parcel of a strip tillage program where we're essentially trying to do some fall strip. And here you see what we were doing in November. That's one of the problems with, uh, with Indiana compared to Alabama is that we get snow and we have to deal with frost and all of that sort of thing. But it does mean it's kind of a pretty picture uh, for what we were doing here in November. So the, the interest really is in, in one of applying uh, phosphorus or potassium at the same time, in a fall program in Indiana, we do not recommend uh, fall anhydrous application, um, but in uh, states to the west of us, that uh, happens to a, a greater extent. I don't think it's a very wise stewardly management of nitrogen necessarily, but it is a response sometimes to a cheaper price of nitrogen in the fall, as well as an opportunity to get uh, some of the spring work um, out of the way. And at the end of the day, uh, what I'd uh, like to do is uh, most is, is perhaps not just learn about corn, but train graduate students. And, and, um, and that to me is, is one of the most fulfilling parts of what I do. And so I'll put a plug out there if you're uh, 22 or 42. Uh, 62, maybe it's a little late to start graduate school, but you know anywhere in the range of 22 to 42, if you're looking for a grad school program, uh, come to Purdue. We, we, we promise to boil her up. Boil her up. <laughs> boil her. Why, that didn't come across very well. Anyway, modern hybrids. That's really what you asked me to talk about. And, um, and what does that mean? So modern hybrids, as uh, the previous speaker, Ron, also talked about, are going to be, uh, perhaps, especially with uh, drought tolerant hybrids, are going to be more resistant to water stress. They're certainly going to be green longer, and so that's shown here, compared to hybrids that uh, senesce much earlier in the grain filling period on the right-hand side. Um, and what does that mean for nitrogen um, options in terms of timing and, and rate? And that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is uh, sort of one of the high clearance options, in this case with uh, coulters, so that you can inject, let's say, liquid UAN between rows, uh, even fairly late in uh, uh, vegetative growth. Now, all of this starts from the presumption that hybrids are different today than they were uh, 20 or uh, 30 or 40 years ago. It's a challenge in agronomic research um, at, you know, to always have relevant research to today's genetics because today's genetics change so quickly. And, and you saw that with uh, Dr. Ron's program earlier. He's trying to use you know, modern Pioneer, DeKalb, or Syngenta hybrids um, to reflect on you know, how do they respond to management in a particular environment. But I, I want to go back a little bit and essentially say that one of the things that's fundamentally different about today's um, hybrids in general is that uh, they are higher yielding, of course, which is kind of what you expect, um, but they are also um, uh, much different in their nitrogen timing of uptake and their efficiency of utilization of nitrogen. 
So um, we went through all of the known literature around the world and divided um, the corn uh, results that we found from published literature from before 1990 and then in the period from 1991 to 2011. The average year that was the average for the results of the trials that were reported was 1984 from this 50-year uh, period, and the average for this 20-year period was actually 2001, right in the middle. Uh, nitrogen rates in these various trials um, had a whole range, 0 to 500 pounds, but the average for what we're reporting here is 125 pounds. The average density is 6,000 plants per acre higher. The average yield is 30 bushels per acre higher. And what are the main differences? The main differences essentially are that we are producing more grain per unit of nitrogen taken up in the plant. So we're now producing an average of 56 pounds of nitrogen, of, of grain, I should say, for every pound of nitrogen taken up above ground. And then the other main thing that's occurred is the fact that uh, while we've increased um, yields, and while we're being more efficient in producing grain per unit nitrogen is that our grain uh, nitrogen concentration, or in other words, our protein content has, has gone down, as has our average uh, stover nitrogen uh, gone down. So, um, but I don't want to pretend that everything is just so cut and dried, and there can be a lot of variation in how much yield is produced per unit of nitrogen taken up above ground. So this is only looking at the modern period here of 1991 to 2011. We've got 2,000 data points in here from all over the world. And this kind of shows that, say, for an, um, an average yield of, let's say, uh, 200 bushels per acre going over here, that, uh, that we can um, essentially have quite a wide range in the actual nitrogen uptake in terms of a pound per acre basis. So you could have as little as a whole plant uptake of, a uh, little bit less than a pound of nitrogen per bushel, but you could also uh, be requiring as, as much as uh, 1.6 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. So this range is, is quite broad, and what, ha what accounts for that? A large part of that is accounted for by, number one, there are differences among hybrids even within a seed company for a particular year, even within a, a, a maturity. And then secondly, there's a huge impact of management on to, uh, in terms of the responsiveness of, uh, of corn to how much grain do you produce for every unit of nitrogen you take up. And, and some of that is the plant population, some of that is planting date, and so there's a whole host of factors that go in. So when we think about being stewards of the nitrogen, to keep it going into the plant instead of disappearing off into the environment, we have um, a, a large range to play with in terms of thinking about modern uh, corn hybrids. And so um, that brings us around to just how do we uh, put on our nitrogen today um, and are there options to consider if we're thinking about being more responsive to hybrids um, taking up more of their nitrogen later today than they did before. And so here are uh, sort of, you know, the four um, options that we, we see the most of, at least in Indiana, um, and that is essentially uh, fall pre-application, normally with anhydrous ammonia, uh, or my son here in Texas, a spring pre-plant, or at plant, uh, with, which takes a lot of um, normally uh, liquid and, and, and it's not so nice from a planting point of view because you've got to slow down so much to refill the uh, nitrogen or a side dress application. So I'm going to stop here for a moment and just I want to get a feel for how many of you are doing 80% or more of your nitrogen pre-plant. Just raise your hands. How many are pre-plant with 80% or more of their nitrogen? Anybody in that category? Okay, how many are 80% um, in or, or more in a, in a side dress application then? Is that the majority of you? Okay, I want to know, um, for those of you that are in sort of a, um, you know, a side dress or after plant uh, phase, how many of you are uh, doing two applications? Are there any that are doing two post-planting applications? So there's some of you that are doing, oh, okay, this uh, more of you that are doing two. And I think that's 
sort of the direction that uh, represents perhaps the biggest efficiency gain that we can do with modern hybrids. The previous study that I talked about is, um, is kind of like a snapshot of what's out there. The problem with that study is that it took a study that was done, let's say, in North Carolina and another study that was done in Alabama and one in Indiana for a particular set of time. So, um, you know, perhaps uh, Professor A, he, uh, you know, worked at Auburn University, was fired five years later, wasn't able to continue, um, and so there is this paper out there. What that doesn't do is that doesn't compare the hybrids side by side grown in the same environment. Um, and so what we did a couple years ago is we, um, we got some funding from uh, Monsanto as well as from the Indiana Corn Marketing Council, and we began to side-by-side uh, -side plant hybrids from different decades going from 2000, uh, 1960 to 2005, and we uh, planted them at 22, uh, 32 and 42,000 plants per acre at two nitrogen rates, 50 pounds to give some stress, and 200 pounds for a corn soybean program, which should be more than, than adequate. And we do a lot of uh, processing of plants um, in a trial like this in order to try to capture when is the nitrogen taken up, how much is taken up at a different population for a different hybrid uh, representing a different era of, um, of production. And so it's a, a large crew that we put together to do this. <clears throat> I'm going to look at just, uh, it, I had eight hybrids in that one. I'm only going to condense it down to just looking at the, th the, um, the three extremes, or the four extremes in the next uh, slide. And I'm going to look at a situation where we compare 2005 hybrids versus the common older hybrid of, from 1975 for the nitrogen rate, which should have been more than adequate for corn soybean, of 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And this is done with a uh, PhD student. And what we're looking at here is grain yield. So the two modern hybrids, um, one is a, a triple stack, one is just Roundup Ready Isoline only, 225 bushels per acre compared to uh, the older hybrid here. And in this and in subsequent slides, whenever you see gray, you're seeing like an old hybrid. It's just like, why do I wear a hat today? Because I've got so much damn gray hair, they can't do anything about it, so I cover it up. So when you see gray, think, old, all right? So that's essentially what you're doing. So um, essentially, so this older hybrid here is yielding about uh, 35 bushels less, and it's um, also taking up about 40 less pounds of nitrogen. And a big part of that reduction, the fact that it's taking up 40 pounds less nitrogen in the above ground parts of the plant is because it's taking up a much less uh, fraction of that total nitrogen in the after uh, silking period. So this is about 38%, this is 30%. So what that means is if you grow these hybrids side by side, the older hybrids are taking up less nitrogen, but the biggest difference is that they do not continue to take up nitrogen as long in their growth cycle. Um, this is um, hybrid era influence again, and again I'll, um, I'll bring, up the, uh, bring up the old hybrids here. In this case, we've got the same 75 hybrid as well as one from 1967. And again, showing the fact that we've got a lot more nitrogen being taken up at the, um, in, as we go from 50 to 200 pounds than we do with these, these older hybrids. So that's one aspect which is very, very important, is just how much total nitrogen do you need to satisfy the yield levels of the current hybrids? But the other one you need to think about is the timing of, as to when that nitrogen is taken up. And some of the most intensive work that we did was essentially to look at various nitrogen um, amounts, medium, low, and high. Um, in this particular case, this is starter only. Uh, medium was 100 pounds, high was uh, 200 pounds in a corn soybean program. Um, and we had three plant populations again because just as is I'm sure true here in Alabama, plant population is increasing. These, this just shows the results for Indiana. We're increasing at the rate of about 330 plants per acre per year because the modern hybrids are more stress tolerant in terms of being able to produce higher yields at higher densities. 
So uh, we, we plan our plots with RTK uh, precision guidance, and um, we do a lot of work then to try to figure out um, when is that nitrogen uh, taken up and, and how responsive is it to the intersection, basically, of nitrogen and plant population. And uh, so here, in this particular case, we're um, working with Dow hybrids because they funded this particular program, 22,000, 32,000, and 42,000. And uh, these are the yield responses, averaged over two, uh, two hybrids, two locations, two years. And the main thing I want to demonstrate from this is what happens at, let's say, 100 pound nitrogen rate. We know that our highest yields occur at 32,000 with 200 pounds, so that's shown here. But what happens at this intermediate nitrogen rate? In this particular case, it was 100 pounds plus 20 pounds of starter. And essentially, uh, what you see here is that we've, we're producing around um, 170 bushels or so at the 100 pound rate at 22,000. As we go on to 32,000, this intermediate nitrogen rate drops in yield. And here again, at 42,000, it drops even more in yield, so that now we've got at least a 20 to 25 bushel difference between the 22,000 and the 42,000. So one of the challenges here is that as we go to higher densities, there is a bigger risk associated with nitrogen deficiency stress. So higher plant densities are fine in and of themselves in responsive hybrids for a given water availability, but there is an inherently bigger risk of having a yield reduction come about uh, at the high density because, in fact, uh, that high density corn is more likely to suffer in yield uh, when nitrogen um, is deficient. And this just shows essentially the grain yields um, in this trial um, for uh, a two year period um, for the different nitrogen rates. Red is zero, blue is 100 pounds, and yellow is 200 pounds and essentially showing the rather straight line relationship between whole plant nitrogen uptake and yield levels. So higher yields essentially then require uh, more nitrogen. In this particular trial, we looked at um, nitrogen uptake at uh, V5, V10, V15, R1, R3, and R6, and, the, and, the, and, and this essentially shows uh, how much nitrogen is in the plant at a particular stage. So let's just say here, um, this is for the 200 pound nitrogen rate. We're here at about 160 pounds of actual land that's taken up by that particular time, but there's more to come. And in fact, we've got about 71% of our nitrogen in the plant at silking, which means that we need in this particular trial to accumulate another 30% uh, during the um, period from, during the grain field period. So we've essentially got, um, you know, another 70 or 80 or some type, in some cases, 100 pounds more of nitrogen to go in after, after flowering. And uh, the story is a little bit more complicated than that, and that is that um, rec more recently, I've been a lot more concerned about not just nitrogen by itself, but nitrogen and its consequences for the availability of other nutrients that are also very essential. And so um, in this trial, uh, you've seen this slide was a sort of a small slide that I showed, just a previous one. But there's more nutrients going in than that, obviously, and so one of those is phosphorus. By silking time, only 45% of the phosphorus is in the plant. Uh, the, 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 uh, during the grain filling period, we've got 55% of the phosphorus going into the plant. So the majority then of the total phosphorus is going in after flowering. The majority of zinc is going in after flowering. Um, at least 40% uh, of our sulfur is going in after flowering, 30% of our magnesium. And in potassium, potassium is the only one that's sort of out there by itself. Potassium is essentially in the plant uh, for all intents and purposes at flowering time. It may accumulate a little more, um, but it also tends to lose potassium pretty quickly as you go towards black layer on corn because it's beginning to be leached out of the stalks and the leaves already. So this is uh, kind of a wake-up call in the sense that it's not just nitrogen you need to worry about. You need to worry about the season-long availability of uh, some of these, these nutrients. And it's also possible that 
uh, when you go to higher yield levels, you in fact uh, might, in some cases, uh, lose some of that efficiency that I was talking about. So we've had experiments where essentially the um, nitrogen efficiency didn't increase as we continued to go to higher yield levels. In fact, we've seen uh, some situations where um, in order to get to, let's say, 200 bushels, we needed to have around one pound of nitrogen per uh, bushel of grain. But to get to yield levels of uh, 275 plus, we needed to have something in the neighborhood of, of 1.2 uh, pounds of nitrogen in the plant to get to those higher yield levels. A big part of what we do is trying, in trying to estimate nitrogen has historically been to measure soil nitrate status. Um, so you might, let's say, do a pre dress um, soil nitrogen test. Or you might, um, you might look at, let's say, you know, stock in at the, at the end of harvest. But what we do really too little of is to try to analyze our plant right at the time when it's taken up the majority of its nitrogen, and that is right around the silking period. It's still, you know, at that stage, it could be taking up five pounds of nitrogen per day. Um, it's a massive amount, but it's also during that stage that the plant can tell you whether or not it's sufficient, not just for nitrogen, uh, but for other nutrients as well. And so this is uh, uh, Pioneer hybrids, uh, 1395 and 1567, grown at, a, at nitrogen rates from 0 to 180 plus 20 pounds of starter. And this is essentially ear leaf nitrogen concentrations at silking time. So what I'm going to do, I guess, is to encourage uh, two things today. The one would be late split nitrogen application. But for those of you that are crop consultants, I would encourage you to spend more time in the fields at flowering time, absolutely the worst time perhaps to walk through a cornfield, but it is uh, the best time to get ear leaf samples in order to tell you whether or not you are in the right range with nutrient concentrations, not just for nitrogen, but for other nutrients as well. And so um, these are some of the uh, yield results here from 2010, 2011, and 2012, which was a drought year for us, and our yields didn't really get above 150 bushels per acre. What ear leaf nitrogen concentration did we need to get to the highest yield levels? And, and usually that's here, it's, is in the range of 2.5% plus. Uh, phosphorus is also determined in this uh, ear leaf uh, test. And again, the, the relationships, except in 2012, where there is no relationship, are positive with uh, ear leaf uh, phosphorus concentration. This is for a situation where the soil test P was between 20 and 30 uh, parts per million when we sampled down to an 8-inch depth, and for a situation where we added uh, starter P205 of 60 pounds per acre. So we've got uh, fair, a fair, fairly high dose of uh, starter phosphorus in this situation. And I think it's sort of time that um, in land-grant institutions, at least, we spend a little bit more time determining what is the sufficiency level of ear leaf nutrient concentrations at, in modern hybrids at substantially higher yield levels. And that's shown a little bit uh, here in the sense that uh, here are the yield levels uh, going from 0 to 250 uh, for nitrogen, first of all. And this essentially shows that uh, in order to get to higher yield levels, we need to be above about 2.9%. Um, and that is, in fact, where the Indiana uh, tri-state uh, nutrient sufficiency concept is. So for this one, this is a published rate, 2.9% plus. And, and here, I think we're pretty good. This is uh, phosphorus. And here, the minimum level that's uh, suggested is uh, perhaps somewhere around 0.3%. Uh, um, so that's shown over here. Uh, here it's potassium. The minimum level for potassium that's recommended is essentially 1.9%. And these results here say that we should really be in the neighborhood of 2.3 plus uh, percent potassium. And this is the range for, for sulfur uh, compared to the published critical levels um, in the ear leaves. This is uh, the relationships for zinc. Uh, mind you, all of these experiments are responses to either nitrogen or to phosphorus. Um, and here it's true for manganese. 20 parts per million is often determined to be 
the critical level, this results here kind of suggests we ought to be uh, around 30 to 40 parts per million in the uh, ear leaf. Iron, the critical level here is at 20 parts per million. These results here suggest that we ought to be around 60 or 70 uh, parts per million and, and so on. So I guess what I'm trying to build the picture of here is that the advantage of an ear leaf sample is that it tells you not just nitrogen, but it tells you some of the sufficiency of some of these other nutrients. And I believe we should pay more attention to achieving nutrient balance, not just simply looking at nitrogen because it's the most expensive nutrient um, and it's perhaps the one corn is most responsive to, but it is very critical that we determine uh, just where we're at in terms of these um, other nutrients. And so recently we, uh, we also again did a around the world study on uh, looking at ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus and nitrogen to potassium. And this is another sort of balance question for me. I mean, the, the balance in your personal life tells a lot about who you are and, and how you will react to stress. And the same thing is true with a corn plant. If a corn plant is better balanced in terms of its nutrient um, composition for the critical growth stages, it will also be better able to tolerate uh, a temperature stress or a moisture stress. And so this is essentially um, uh, shows uh, results here of uh, looking at nitrogen to phosphorus uh, ratios at the end of the season. And the bigger um, balls here or the bigger squares kind of indicate higher yield levels. The uh, data in the red is all from the US and the yellow data is all from the rest of the world. 2,300 points in this one. And basically the ratio that is ideal in a corn plant for higher yield levels of nitrogen to phosphorus is five to one at the whole plant level. And the ratio that is ideal for higher yield levels in uh, terms of nitrogen to potassium is essentially one to one. So if you hear presentations that say we should be taking out 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen, um, that means that um, at maturity now, we should also have about 250 pounds of uh, potassium in the, in the corn plant. So most of the focus though on late application is with nitrogen. And uh, this can be done a, a number of ways. It could be done with um, you know, uh, perhaps a, a bulk spread urea or a ESN or, or something like that. But in our program, we're uh, putting more of our attention on uh, using injected uh, UEN using coulter systems between rows. And the, the um, hypothesis here is that basically modern hybrids are going to be more responsive to that late split nitrogen. And also that we ought to uh, be thinking about doing a late split as a pre-planned program. We face sometimes um, very high rain amounts um, where instead of having, let's say, four inches of rain a month in June, July, and August, we get eight inches. And whenever you have excessive rain, you have losses due to denitrification as well as due to leaching. And a side dress program is already a big step forward compared to a pre-plant nitrogen program, which is what the majority of Indiana and Illinois and Iowa farmers do. But even then, I think that uh, we should move towards the intentional um, late application of 30 to 40 units, perhaps 30 to 50 units of nitrogen. So if the recommendation for nitrogen for a particular yield level is, let's say, 200 pounds, then I would recommend that we go in the direction of essentially saying we're going to apply that last 40 or 50 pounds um, we're, um, and we're intentionally going to apply it later. And by later, I essentially mean where possible to go after the V10, if not after the V12 stage, because of this high amount of nitrogen that goes into the plant at uh, later stages. And um, <laughs> this coming season, we're going to be uh, working with some uh, producers in Indiana who um, are working with high clearance applicators. And one of those, I just thought it was kind of a unique picture, um, is essentially showing a uh, UEN injection system with coulters every second row rather than every row as is shown here in, in a soybean field. 
So the idea here is B12 plus um, application in high yield corn. And so uh, because of uh, funding from Pioneer, um, again, working with another young lady as a master's student, uh, shown here with some of the Pioneer agronomists, and we're essentially looking at this whole thing of essentially how much yield benefit may there be for uh, hybrids by intentionally going late. These are the old hybrids here, 20 year old hybrids, 3335, 3394. Here is 1360 as well as 1498. It's a hybrid that uh, Dr. Ron referred to in his previous presentation. And essentially uh, this is the results of uh, zero plus 20 pounds of uh, starter going up to 140. You can go on to 180 pounds as we've done here or 220 pounds as a side dress. But what if you took, let's say 180 late, so this is a split late application. So this would mean 140 pounds of uh, side dress application at let's say the V5 uh, stage followed by another 40 pounds after V12. And that's essentially where we got the uh, highest yields, so 17 bushels higher than the 140 pound rate for that hybrid. Another hybrid though, also 114 day hybrid, uh, did not respond the same way. So this is essentially just uh, first year and we're going to be expanding that uh, with other hybrids and on-farm situations this coming year. But essentially, um, I believe that there's quite a few hybrids today that are very responsive to a late split N. And I think that from a stewardship point of view, it makes sense to plan on a late end rather than to only putting on a late end in a rescue situation. A rescue situation is you've put on the full intended rate. Now let's just say for argument's sake, that's 200 pounds. And now you find, oh, I've lost a fair bit of nitrogen because of excessive rain. And so I'm going to put on another 50 units of actual land um, at a later stage, whether it's with an airplane or a high clearance applicator. And I think we got to be moving away from that because uh, we're uh, really, we're stewards of the land, but we're also stewards of the air and the water. And uh, one of those whole issues is essentially nitrous oxides uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And most of those uh, come from our nitrogen fertilizer applications. And we have uh, a responsibility then from an air quality point of view, as well as from a water quality point of view to reduce that. And so essentially part of the stewardship aspect of the program is essentially looking at, let's say, uh, side dress nitrogen application or this late split nitrogen application and essentially uh, studying uh, the uh, loss of greenhouse gases uh, when we, let's say, put on a particular rate at a particular time of UAN and when we also add on, let's say, a nitrification inhibitor and this is with a sidekick system, and this is essentially adding Instinct, which is one of the uh, products from Dow, which is very similar to NSERV, let's say, for an anhydrous ammonia um, application. And what happens with that is if we, uh, if we do it well, we essentially have uh, much lower nitrous oxide emissions with Instinct in the red compared to UAN alone. Um, and um, in some cases that can mean quite dramatic uh, results. Here we're losing uh, four pounds per acre of nitrogen with UAN plus instinct to the air above. With UAN alone, we're losing 15 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. So it's a lot of loss that can occur. And, uh, but even a, a better situation would be never to rely on a single technology. Always put technologies together when you're trying to be a steward of the nutrients. And so in this particular case, we applied the same rate of nitrogen to no-till and chisel plow with and without uh, UAN alone side dress compared to UAN plus instinct. And uh, we were able to get nitrous oxide emissions down to effectively one and a half pound um, in the situation where we had instinct compared to a chisel plow situation where we um, had about three pounds of nitrogen loss as, as nitrous oxides. Now nitrous oxides are just a small part of the total end loss that occurs. A lot of this end loss that occurs is occurring in the form of uh, N2 from denitrification. So there's more going on than, than what's shown here, but nitrous oxides are the concern from a greenhouse uh, gas point of view. So I'm gonna wrap it up here by saying modern hybrids, they're entirely different. 
yes, there are big differences sometimes between hybrids, but as a group, modern hybrids take up um, more of their nitrogen post-silking. They probably take up at least 40 pounds more uh, and in 200 bushel plus corn, sometimes as much as 80 uh, pounds per acre more. Post-silking nitrogen now makes up at least 56% uh, of the final nitrogen in the grain. Higher plant densities can really be hurt by nitrogen deficiencies compared to lower plant densities. No-till can limit nitrogen losses um, and uh, putting it together with um, inhibitors and so on are a good thing from a, a nitrogen stewardship point of view. Um, but I think we ought to have a lot more research that goes on into this late split uh, nitrogen application and as well as some of the risks associated with that in terms of damage to corn. Um, and uh, we need to focus not just on nitrogen alone, but on some of these other nutrients, uh, which are also limiting, especially when you consider how much of those nutrients is coming into the corn plant after flowering, rather than the vegetative period that uh, we typically worry about. And so I'd recommend as one strategy, essentially doing a lot more um, effort in, in uh, sampling ear leaves at the R1 stage. And so finally, uh, side dressing, some or all, is certainly um, <coughs> superior to pre-plant alone. Um, enhanced efficiency uh, fertilizers uh, where possible, especially in pre-plant applications. And then late season uh, applications, especially, uh, of course, where there's losses. But maybe for modern hybrids, maybe we ought to go to a different strategy of essentially saying we will never put on more than, let's say, 50 uh, percent of our total nitrogen application in any one time, and we will intentionally use that resource uh, more in synchrony with when the modern hybrids take up um, their, their nutrients um, and, and the nitrogen nutrient in that specific case. Over the years, I've had the benefit of uh, loans and uh, grant funding from a number of different seed companies, and without their work, I would not have been able to train graduate students or learn and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes? If you test the plant at R1 or at Silky, you already really want to have the nitrogen available, don't you? If you have a shortfall at that point, then you add it on. But I, heard you, I understand you don't want to put it all out at the beginning, but you want it to be there when the plant needs it. Not when you test it and sometime later, right. all that's going to take a period of time. So how do you get all that <laughs> Yeah, I, I hear you in the sense that there is a challenge in uh, getting nitrogen on. Um, the, the challenge is less daunting if you're in the irrigated corn system, where I believe that you could still, with a R1 sampling, still have a nitrogen application and response to, let's say, a fertigation program for the last 30 or 40 units applied even as late as the, as the R2 or even R3 stage because we're still getting a lot of nitrogen going into the plant at the R2 and R3 stages. It is true that from a management point of view, sampling at the R1 stage may not uh, be a good strategy for, let's say, a you know, a situation where you're trying to apply it at V12, V14. But it represents the best known benchmark we have today. And the benchmark goes, you know, all the way back against, uh, you know, data sets from people doing research on corn uh, 40 and 50 years ago. And it represents a benchmark, perhaps that's uh, as important for determining the sufficiency of the other nutrients, even more so than for nitrogen itself. And so I, th I think that's why I'm going in that direction is, yes, for a rain-fed system without, you know, really high clearance capability, it's a post-mortem for the nitrogen. But it's also a way of telling you whether you are uh, in the uh, sufficiency range for these other nutrients right at the time when the corn plant's taking up the most of its nitrogen. We are also going to be studying, and it's a very important point you make, this whole aspect of trying to determine earlier sampling. 
And I don't believe that V6 leaf stages uh, tell us very much at all. Um, and so I, I believe that there is progressively more benefit from later sampling. And, and perhaps in the long run, maybe what we should be doing is putting more focus on, let's say, a V10 um, application now, or a V10 sampling. The way that that's done today is entirely different, essentially, because we're essentially relying on sensors um, like crop circle and uh, green seeker. Thank you. Uh, and there's a precision agriculture expert, so she can tell you how to how to work with that bit the best, right? Yeah, V6 is not the best. V6 is terrible, right? So for that kind of uh, application, but that'll so so that is a technique that uh, can be that I would say can complement a actual um, an, an actual plant sampling. I, I guess I'm sort of more stuck in trying to um, determine as much as possible what the nutrients are inside the plant rather than only relying on a reflectance to tell you. But it is true that the reflectance uh, systems are very effective as provided that you have a true um, adequate nitrogen control for the same hybrid planted on the same day. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here, and uh, I also go into a uh, CCA conference. Uh, for Indiana that we're uh, hosting for the next few days. And, and this is a really important educational opportunity, and I wish you all the best uh, in this coming Christmas season, but also in, in your work at uh, being stewards, not just on a financial basis, but on an environmental basis. So thank you very much. Thank you.